Hi, my name is Dylan, and welcome to Chapter 4 of the Baron's AP Economics book. Um, in this chapter, I will be outlining the important stuff you need to know for the AP exam, both micro and macro, explaining each concept in depth. So here's what you need to know for this chapter. You need to know what a competitive market is. You should know the difference between quantity demanded changes and changes in demand. You should know the difference between quantity supplied and changes in supply. Um, another, you should, I'm going over equilibrium pricing again. Um, we shall, you should also know what price ceilings and price floors are, normal goods versus inferior goods, and the conditions for changing demand and supply. So in a competitive market, sellers are price takers. They have no control over the price of the goods. There are just simply too many sellers for any one single seller to make an impact on the market. They have to sell their goods at the market rate. If they try to sell their goods at a price higher than the equilibrium price, no one will buy their goods because they can, because they can just buy the goods at the market rate from everyone else. And there is no point trying to sell their goods at a lower price than everyone else because they can sell as much as they want to at the e equilibrium price. So the lower price is just reducing profits. However, this only applies for perfectly competitive markets. In the real world, there are other types of markets that are imperfect, where the price of the good isn't just decided by the market. So now, <clears throat> I'll be going over the concept of ceteris paribus. This is a, an important economic concept. And whenever we model something that changes, we have to make sure that the ceteris paribus exists, and it means to hold any of all other factors and all other conditions constant. So when you change one variable, everything else has to stay, stay the same. This is because in economics, the whole field is based on analyzing what happens from one change only. If the price of something changes, it's possible to speculate the various scenarios that could be happening, but then it would be possible to analyze what would be the result of that price change. That's why in economics, everything else has to be held in constant when analyzing one variable. So, quantity of demand versus change of demand. The amount demanded will change along a curve only if price changes. So I will draw a demand curve right now. So right here. This is your demand curve. This is price. This is quantity. So right now, if I lower the price, the quantity changes. If I increase the quantity, the price decreases. But notice how this curve stays the same, and I'm just moving along this curve. The whole demand will change if one of the determinants of demand changes. As I said in the previous unit, let's just say um, this is let's just say this is the market for shirts, and suddenly people like sweaters. So now the demand will decrease. Now this is your new demand curve. Notice how the whole curve shifts to the left. The whole curve moves. And at every single point, there's a lower quantity sold than at the previous one. That's a whole curve change. But if you raise or lower the price, you only move along this curve. Similarly, the quantity supplied is very different than changes in supply. As in the previous one, um, I can sample show this on a supply curve. So here's your y-axis price. This is quantity. So this is your supply curve. So if I were to raise the price of something, that would change the quantity supplied. So just go up. If I want to lower the price, it would just decrease the quantity supplied. So notice how the curve again doesn't change at all. But let's say, just say suddenly it becomes cheaper to produce eggs. So now your supply would increase. And notice how the whole curve increases. And so this is important to know the difference between, because because the AP exam will always quiz you on this. Now I will talk about normal and inferior goods. This is a pretty small topic, but there's always going to be a question on normal and inferior goods and how it relates to income. Normal goods are so-called normal. When incomes increase, the demand for normal goods increase. So if I made more money, I would just buy more goods. It just, it's logic. Inferior goods, however, or trickier because they're the opposite. If income increases, people buy less of it. So how does that work? Inferior goods are sort of like tough time goods. Stuff like ramen noodles or cheap cars. Stuff people would rather not buy if they didn't have to. If it's a recession, the demand for inferior goods go, will go up because people can't buy the regular goods. But if the economy is doing fine, people would rather get real food than ramen. So that's how inferior goods work.
Now the equilibrium price of good will change based upon changes in supply and demand. Let's just take a regular supply and demand graph. And let's just, here's your y-axis, x-axis, supply, this is demand, quantity, price, um, equilibrium price, equilibrium quantity, E, P, Q. Now let's just say the income of people increases, so they, therefore the demand will increase. So this is the new demand graph. And so now your equilibrium price is here. So you can tell from this that the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity both increased. And you know that's for sure. Why? Because it's new, higher than the old one. This is higher than the old one. And you know that no matter how much you shift, well, they never actually tell you how much the demand curve will shift, then you know that it does increase. And no matter how, where it is, the price and quantity will be higher than the old one. And let's just say the supply will shift as well. Let's just say it moved to the right as well. So you know that the new price is here, or somewhere around here, and the quantity is down here. But you don't know exactly how much where the new price is. It can be it can be the same as the old one. It can be way higher. It can be way lower. But you don't know. However, you do know that the equal quantity is definitely higher because no matter how you shift demand and supply to the right, the new quantity will be higher than the old quantity. There's always been a question on this, asking you if the demand and supply or supply or both increases, how will this affect the price and the quantity? Make sure you always look for the option for inter indeterminate, because if you're not sure how if how much the price increases, it's probably inter inter indeterminate. Now I'll talk about price ceilings and price floors. Price ceilings and price floors can only be created by the government. They're usually to correct for some failures in the free market. Price ceilings are maximum prices for a good, hence the word ceiling. They're usually created if the equilibrium price is too high to be deemed optimal for society. A real world example is sort of having max interest rates in a mortgage. This ends up creating shortages because the quantity demanded is higher than the quantity supplied. The price floors are the opposite. They are the minimum prices for the goods, hence the word floor. They are created if the equilibrium price is deemed too low for society. Think of minimum wages. They create surpluses because the quantity supplied is large and the quantity demanded is small. And since the equilibrium price is lower than the floor. We can model these price ceilings and price floors on a standard supply and demand graph. Let's take the market for labor, for example. That was the supply of labor and this is the demand for labor. This is the price. And this is the quantity. That's the equilibrium price. It's the equilibrium quantity. Now, let's say the government decides to enact the minimum wage. So we've enact the minimum wage right here above the above the equilibrium price. Let's call this minimum wage. And so right here you notice there's a gap. Right here is the amount of people who want to work for this much. Because it's higher than, than the old price, a lot more people are willing to work. But because, at the same time, businesses don't want to hire as many people because it's higher than the old wage. So this is the quantity demanded, this is the quantity supplied. You'll notice right here there's a gap. This is because more people want to work than the people businesses want to hire. And right now, this is called a surplus. And this is a result of the market inefficiency created by a price for. But let's say the government decides to enact a maximum wage. You can only hire pay people lower than this amount. This is called a price seal. And right here you notice there's another gap. This is because more businesses want to hire people than people actually want to work. And this is called a shortage, another market inefficiency. That's it for this chapter. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something from this video.